Hi, I'm Miss Ricky. Um, I teach challenge and AT math and AT reading for second, third, and fourth grade. I'm going to read chapter eight for your dragons in a bag. Chapter eight. After a sickening loop-the-loop, the guardhouse lands with a thud and I lift my head, still clutching Ma's purse. A single blue current of electricity snakes up the door closest to me before fizzling out. I get to my feet and carefully extend a finger to test the door. No shock. I can't tell whether the door faces the street or the park, so I just lean my shoulder against it and push as hard as I can. When the door flies open, I tumble out of the guardhouse and land on a patch of earth that's more mud than grass. I get up, brush myself off, and take a moment to look around. I'm definitely in Prospect, Prospect Park, but what year is it? I sigh with relief when my jogger trots past with a smartphone strapped to her arm and wires leading up to the buds in her ears. I'm home. Then I look at the dirt path leading into the woods and remember that I left Ma behind in the jungle. My eyes fill with tears again, but I quickly blink them away. I'm Ma's helper, and I have to find a way to bring her home, too, but I can't do it on my own. Who will help me? I pick up Ma's purse and close the guardhouse door behind me. My heart leaps when I go around to the front of the guardhouse and find Ambrose sitting on the stone bench. Through mirrored sunglasses, he's watching the sky, which is still overcast, though it's not raining anymore. When pedestrians walk by, Ambrose ducks his head so that the airy space where his face should be disappears from view. I hurry over to the bench, but then freeze when I realize Ambrose might blame me for what happened to Ma. After all, they've been friends for a really long time. I don't think Ambrose is a witch, but what if he gets angry and refuses to help me? My heart starts beating fast, making it hard to breathe and speak at the same time. So I plant myself on the bench next to Ambrose and blurt out, Ma's gone, Ambrose. She's gone. Ambrose jumps and shifts on the bench to face me. Whoa, slow down, kid. I take a deep breath, but I can't calm down. Ma's gone, Ambrose. We have to help her. I know Ma's gone. I sent her on her way, remember? I nod and then shake my head and then nod again. Finally, I take a deep breath and try to make more sense. That's not what I mean. I went with Ma to deliver the dragons, but something happened to the transporter. It took us back in time, way back, instead of crossing to another dimension. When we landed, there was no magic, but there were plenty of dinosaurs. One attacked us, and that's when I... I... My voice dwindles to a whisper, and Ambrose has to lean in to hear me confess. I left Ma behind. For a while, Ambrose doesn't say a word. I see my reflection in the mirrored lenses of his sunglasses. I look as scared and guilty as I feel. Ambrose finally raises his gloved hand to scratch the place where his chin should be. Hmm, he says thoughtfully. Sounds like you need a guide, someone to steer the ship, so to speak, and it has to be someone who can navigate between dimensions. Another witch? I ask hopefully. Not quite, says Ambrose, but he's the best man for the job. He's the only man for the job, really, so let's hope he's in town. You say there were dinosaurs in this other place? I nod and glance at the harmless pigeons strutting along the sidewalk. It's hard to believe that today's birds are the last of the dinosaurs. We were in a jungle, and there was an erupting volcano... And I climbed down a cliff to get Ma this sparkling stone. Quartz, she called it. Even though he has no face, somehow I know that Ambrose is smiling. Ah, quartz, he says. That changes everything. Ambrose points at Ma's purse and asks, What else did she have on her when you uh, got separated? I think for a moment. She had her cane and her pocket watch. That was in her coat pocket. Not fully armed, but well equipped, Ambrose says. Then he asks, You know any dinosaur experts? I nod eagerly. My friend Vic knows a lot about dinosaurs, more than anyone I know. Ambrose sifts through his many pockets before producing two sleek silver phones. Here, he says as he offers one to me. You call your people, I'll call mine. That's how we're going to fix this, Jax. Teamwork. I take the phone from Ambrose. It's not locked, so I go ahead and tap out Vic's number. The phone rings several times before Vic's little sister, Kavita, picks it up. Is Vic there? I ask her. This is Jackson. I have to talk to him right away. Just a moment, please, Kavita says softly. It feels like forever, but only a few seconds pass before Vic picks up the phone. Hey, Jax, he says in his usual friendly voice. What's up? Out of habit, I say, not much. Well, then I remember that there's a lot going on right now. I'm just not sure where or how to begin. Vic's make, Vic makes it easy for me. Where are you, he asks. It sounds kind of loud. Whoever's on the other end of Ambrose's call must have a good sense of humor because he's got Ambrose cracking up. I move, move a few feet away and say, I'm at Prospect Park, Vic. Can you come out? I really need your help. Like, now. Vic doesn't say anything, and for a moment I worry he's going to turn me down. Then I realize Vic's got his hand over the phone, so I can't hear the conversation he's having with someone else. 
I could probably sneak out before dinner, but my little, my little sister says she'll tell on me unless I bring her along. Is that okay? What we need right now is a grown-up, not a little kid, but Ambrose is still laughing into his phone, so that must mean he's got another adult lined up to take Ma's place. Sure, Vic, no problem. Can you come right away? I'm at the entrance on Flatbush, across from the Botanic Garden. I know the one, Vic assures me. Be there in 15 minutes, Jax. Thanks, Vic. You're a lifesaver. I hang up and think about what I just said. Lifesaver. I don't know if Ma's life needs saving or what a couple of kids could even do to help her right now, but another burst of laughter from Ambrose gives me hope. He holds the phone to his ear, even though it's covered by the red toque pulled over his invisible head. Two baseball caps are stacked on top of the toque, and the fedora wobbles at the top as Ambrose laughs. Thanks, man. I gotta go, but I'll tell the kid to wait for you here. What's that? You can't miss him, Trub. He's got your crazy eyebrows. Ambrose laughs again and ends the call before slipping the phone back into his pocket. I hand him the second phone, and he puts it in another pocket before leaning back on the bench. Phew. I think we're set, kid. I called it a favor from an old friend. Name's Trub, and he can't wait to meet you. Why, is he mad at me? I ask nervously. Mad? Of course not. Matter of fact, Trub's a not-so-distant relation of yours, kid. He'll be happy to see you. There are lots of things I want to ask about Trub, but I settle on the most important question. Will he know how to find Ma? I ask. Ambrose nods and manages to catch his fedora before it topples off his head. If she wants to be found, Trub will find a way to reach her. Wants to be found? What do you mean? She's not hiding from us, Ambrose. I left her behind. Tears spring to my eyes, but I manage to stop them from trickling down my cheeks. I can't stop my nose from running, though, so I open Ma's purse and fish around for her packet of tissues. Ambrose uses one of his gloved hands to pat me on the back. Don't be so sure, and don't be so hard on yourself, kid. The transporter misfires now and again, but Ma don't make mistakes. Could be this is all part of her plan. Plan? How could she plan to send me back alone? There were dinosaurs, Ambrose. Real dinosaurs. Ma wouldn't choose to stay behind in a place like that. Would she? Ambrose shrugs. Hard to say, but if Ma thought you could do something on your own, she might have sent you back so she could deal with other matters. I think about that for a moment. Maybe Ma sent me back alone because she trusted me. I do have the dragons, after all, and keeping them safe is a big responsibility. But I was supposed to help her, I say meekly. Ambrose chuckles again. You're helping her now, kid. I'm glad Ma's got such a loyal assistant. It's hard to find good help these days. Ambrose leaves himself to his feet. Listen, I, I gotta shove off, but trouble's on his way. You sit tight, and he'll make everything right. Just you wait and see. The man I'm waiting for is called Trouble. I feel like I've had as much trouble as I can handle for one day, but I still thank Ambrose for his help and wave as he pushes his cart away. I hold Ma's purse on my lap and hope that Vic gets here soon. I'm not sure how to tell him about Ma, so I practice telling my story in my head until I see Vic coming up the block, holding his sister's hand. I set Ma's bag down on the bench and stand up to wave at Vic. His sister has her nose buried in a book, but I still say hi when she's close enough to hear me. Kavita barely glances at me before slipping off her book bag and taking a seat next to Ma's purse on the bench. I recognize Kavita's book bag because Vic had the same one a couple of years ago. It has green plates on it to mimic the spine of a dinosaur. I didn't know Kavita was also into dinosaurs, but two experts are better than one. What's with the bag? Vic asks with a smirk on his face. I'm so busy thinking about Kavita's book bag that it takes a second for me to realize Vic's talking about Ma's purse. It's not mine, I tell him. It belongs to uh, a friend of mine. And she asked you to hold her purse. Vic asks suspiciously as he walks around for my mystery friend. Not exactly, I reply. This is going to sound crazy, Vic, but I swear everything I'm about to tell you is true. Vic just laughs and says, Strange things happen all the time on my block. I could tell you some stuff you'd find hard to believe. Like what? I ask skeptically. Vic glances at his little sister, but she seems absorbed in her book. You know Carlos and Tariq, right? Sure, they're in Mr. Benson's class, I say. Right, well, a few months ago, they were fixing up the backyard of this rundown house on Barclay Street, and they found a phoenix. No way. It's true, Vic insists. We found a picture of it in the Brooklyn Museum. We tried to take care of it, but it was nearing the end of its life, so... Vic looks over at his sister and decides not to finish his sentence. But I needed to know the fate of that phoenix. So what happened? I ask him. Vic leans in and says... It went up in flames, but that means a new phoenix was born from the ashes. I haven't seen it yet, but I keep my eyes open just in case. You never know what you might find in Brooklyn. I don't know what to say. Ma said magic was leaving the city, but maybe she was wrong. Or maybe Ma was right and Vic's baby phoenix had to find somewhere else to live. The best part of Vic's story is that I've never heard it before, which means he knows how to keep a secret. 
So, Vic says, what's your unbelievable story? I make sure Kavita is still engrossed in her book. Then I step closer to Vic and say, my friend's missing and she's a witch. Vic doesn't blink, so I go on. She received an important package from Madagascar and instructions to take good care of what was inside. And what was inside? Vic asks. Three dragons. This time Vic's eyes grow wide. Actual dragons? I nod, but then confess. Well, I haven't seen them, but that's what Ma said. She saw them? Uh, not exactly. Ma kept them in the dark because there's this thing called imprinting. Vic nods like he doesn't need an explanation. And your friend didn't want the dragons to get attached to a human. Smart move. So where are the dragons now? I point at Ma's bag over on the bench. Then my heart skips a beat. The first thing I notice is that Kavita is no longer reading her book. The second thing I notice is that the familiar red mint tin in, is on her lap. And it's open. No! I cry, but it's too late. Not only are three tiny dragons peering out of the tin, Kavita is feeding them. Kavi, what are you doing? Vic asks. Sharing my snack, she replies without even looking at her brother. Vic and I draw closer to get a better look at the dragons. They're so tiny that they must have had plenty of room inside Ma's mint tin. Two have wings, and one has a long body with plates along its curved spine. All of them have purpley scales that shimmer like the feathers that circle the necks of the strutting pigeons. The dragons look harmless, and they purr happily as they eat the crumbs Kavita is sharing with them. I point at the plastic sandwich bag on Kavita's lap. Inside are two round, ivory-colored cakes. One is whole, and the other has been broken into pieces by Kavita so that she can feed the hungry dragons. I remember what Ma said about not giving the dragons marshmallows. What's in the bag? I ask anxiously. That's Pita, Vic, ex Vic explains. My auntie bought us some from her shop in Queens. I've never heard of Pita, but the dragons can't get enough of it. Kavita laughs as they nip at her fingers and jostle her for more. Ma said newborn dragons love sticky sweet things, I tell Vic. Then they'll love Pita, he says. It's made from milk, sugar, and cardamom. Vic reaches into his sister's bag and takes out the cake that's still whole. A sliced green pistachio nut has been pressed into its center. Vic breaks the cake and hands half to me. Try it. Vic pops his half of the pita into his mouth. I take a small bite at first, but quickly cram the rest in my mouth. It's so good. For a moment, none of us say a word as we savor the sweet, creamy cake. But as the sugary treat dissolves, I realize we have an even bigger problem now. The dragons are gazing up at Kavita with adoration, and I could be wrong, but it looks like they're a little bit bigger than they were just five minutes ago. I don't want to go off on a little girl, so I start with a simple question. Hey, Kavi, how did you find the dragons? I ask. I needed a napkin, so I looked in your purse. It's not my purse, I tell her. It belongs to Ma. Kavi rolls her eyes and said, whatever. I was looking in your mom's purse when I heard something crying, so I... Dragons don't cry, Vic says irritably. How do you know? Kavita asks in the voice that sounds just as annoyed. They sounded sad, so I opened the tin and gave them some of my snack. I look at Vic, and he looks at me before sighing heavily. I'm guessing this isn't the first time his little sister has caused so much trouble. She might be faking it, but Kavita gives us an innocent look and, says, and asks, What's the big deal? You had no right to poke around in Jackson's purse, Vic says angrily. It's not my purse, I remind him. That's right, it belongs to a witch. Vic hisses that last word, and Kavita's eyes grow wide. But you meddled with her dragons, and now they think you are their mother, Vic tells her. I don't mind, Kavita says while stroking the wingless dragon under its chin. The two winged dragons get jealous and clamor for her attention, rubbing against her arm like cats. I mind, I exclaim. Then I look around at the people going in and out of the park and realize I need to keep it down. Those dragons aren't supposed to be here, I tell Kavi. They were supposed to be delivered to someone else, but now you've ruined everything. If Kavita feels bad about what she's done, she sure doesn't show it. Vic picks up the red tin and holds it in his palm. Put them back in, Kavi. Now, he demands. Kavita frowns. They don't want to stay inside that horrible little tin. It doesn't matter what they want, I cry. They need to stay hidden until we can find Ma and deliver them to the right dimension. Just put them back, Kavi, or I'll tell Mommy you were going through a stranger's bag. That works. Kavi puts all three dragons in her palm and lifts them to her mouth to give each one a kiss. Then she sets them in the tin one by one. But when Vic tries to close the lid, the dragons screech and howl like they're in pain. I snatch the tin from Vic and try to force it shut. Stop! You're hurting them! Kavita cries. Vic sighs and says to me, I think you're going to need a bigger tin, Jax. He's right. Just a few crumbs of pita have led to a dragon growth spurt. We're going to need a larger container. 
What about the plastic bag? I ask. Let's put them in there for now and zip it up. Vic grabs the bag with the leftover pita from his sister's lap. He takes out the crumbling cake and offers it to me. I shove the pita in my mouth and then dump all three dragons from the tin into the little bag. But as soon as they start eating the crumbs sticking to the bottom of the bag, their scaly, writhing bodies start to grow some more. Ouch! Vic cries before dropping the bag on the ground. I snatch it up from the ground and see that one corner of the plastic bag has melted. Uh... Oh, I say, I think these are fire-breathing dragons. I unzip the bag and and a wisp of smoke rises from the mouth of the wingless dragon. We need something fireproof, Vic suggests. I might have something at home. I shake my head and watch the dragons as they flick their forked pink tongues over the few pita crumbs left in the plastic bag. I don't have time. Trouble's on his way. Vic gives me a funny look. Trouble? That's Ma's replacement, I tell him. You and your sister don't have to stay, Vic. I honestly don't know what's going to happen next. Vic puts a reassuring hand on my shoulder and says, Well, we'll wait with you and find out. What will we do with the dragons? Kavita asks as she gets up from the vent, up from the bench. That's up to Jackson, not you, Vic snaps at his sister. You need to learn to mind your own business, Kavi. Kavi turns away in a huff and unzips her own bag to place her book inside. I take up Ma's purse and search inside for another container. When I can't find a suitable replacement for the mint tin, I unzip a side pocket and put the sandwich bag inside. Then I close the side pocket and click the latch that holds Ma's purse closed. Sorry about my sister, Vic says. I should have kept a closer eye on her. I turn around and shrug wearily. Don't worry about it, Vic. It's been a crazy kind of day, I tell him. I look up at the blo- up the block and see a tall man with a bushy gray beard and furry gray eyebrows coming our way. And it's not over yet. The tall man holds out his hand before he reaches us, but with three long strides, he's standing right in front of me. You must be Jax, he says with a big smile that reveals a gold tooth. I'm Charlie Randall, but my friends call me Trub. All right, that's the end of chapter eight. Hope you guys enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of your one school book book.